The Sabbath Fountain by Adrian Ebens Chapter 1 The Blessing of the Father's Delight Psalm 33 verses 8 through 9 reads Let all the earth fear the Lord let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him for he spake and it was done he commanded and it stood fast How amazing it would have been to be one of the angels beholding the master builder the Son of the living God, speak this world into existence. Ephesians 3.9 reads, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. John 1.1-3 1, 1 reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And Jesus was to reveal God both to men and to angels. He was the Word of God, God's thought made audible. Desire of Ages, page 19. The Son of God is the Word of God, God's thought made audible. All of the Father's creative power was given to his Son to speak the world into existence. The Sovereign of the universe was not alone in his work of beneficence. He had an associate, a co-worker, who could appreciate his purposes and could share his joy in giving happiness to created beings. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. John 1, 1 and 2. Christ, the Word, the only begotten of God, was one with the Eternal Father, one in nature, in character, in purpose, the only being that could enter into all the counsels and purposes of God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 34. As Christ spoke the words of his Father, the world came into existence. As the grass, trees, and flowers emerged from the earth by the word spoken, the Father turned to his Son and said, This is good, Son. Proverbs 8, 29-30 reads, When he gave to the sea his decree, that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him, as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Each day of this creation, the Son of God felt the delight of his Father in him. The Son of God rejoiced in the blessing of his Father through the creation process, as each day passed, the rejoicing and delight of father and son grew. As they watched Adam and Eve stand in awe of the creation that surrounded them, the father and son felt such joy in the gift they gave so freely. They rejoiced together in their agape love. Then finally the Sabbath came, and as the father beheld the works of creation, as he looked upon the mountains, valleys, and streams, and all the creatures roaming on the earth, he spake with joy to his son, saying, You are my beloved son, in whom I delight. Upon this day, the Son of God was blessed by his Father. The Spirit of the Most High rested upon him, and the Son was refreshed. Exodus thirty-one seventeen reads, in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. The word refreshed in Hebrew means breathed upon. This breathing upon the Son was the Father's delight in his Son. The Son responded with adoration and worship of his Father for giving all things to him. The Father's life flows out to all through the Son it returns, in praise and joyous service, a tide of love to the great source of all. Desire of Ages, page 21. Genesis 2, verse 3 reads, And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. The blessing that God placed in the Sabbath and that is remembered every week is the refreshing that the son experienced through his father's delight. Every seventh day Sabbath, the son of God is breathed upon by the father in memorial of that delight he felt for his son when the creation week was completed. Those who are in Christ receive of this blessing. 
we become inheritors of this blessing through Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1, 3-5 reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. The greatest spiritual blessing we can receive in Christ is to know we are loved by the Father. By faith, we see the Father put his arm around his Son in fatherly delight and kiss him with fatherly affection and tell him, You are my Son, and I delight in you. What else could the Son of God experience except complete and perfect rest in that blessing spoken over him? Is there anything else you could desire other than to be in the bosom of the Father and know, know with absolute certainty that you are loved and delighted in by him? This is the completed work to which the gospel brings us. Hebrews 4, 2-4 reads, For unto us the gospel was preached, as well as unto them, Israel. For we which have believed do enter into rest. The works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. The work of creation and redemption are the same. Both of these things bring you into the arms of the Father to be embraced by Him and experience complete rest and joy in Him. This experience is opened to each of us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And as each seventh day comes to us, we can enter into that same rest that Christ experienced from the foundation of the world. Each Sabbath we can taste in greater measure the delight of the Father for us through His Son. And the word that was spoken to Jesus at the Jordan, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased, embraces humanity. God spoke to Jesus as our representative. With all our sins and weaknesses, we are not cast aside as worthless. He hath made us accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1.6 The glory that rested upon Christ is a pledge of the love of God for us. Desire of Ages, page 113. This is the blessing contained in the Sabbath. It is the refreshing and renewal of the bonds of love between us and our Father through Christ. Each Sabbath engraves more deeply upon our soul the Father's name by the breath of his mouth. How precious is the Sabbath day to the children of God. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. In him I am connected to the delight of my Father. I am accepted in the Beloved. Chapter 2. The Loss of Sonship Through Sin This was the condition of Adam before he fell. He dwelt in the assurance of the Father's love through the Son of God until the destroyer came between them. Satan refused to submit himself to the Son of God, and in so doing he placed himself outside of the delight of his Father. The spirit of the Father's delight only flows through His Son. If we desire the blessing and delight of the Father, we must drink from the fountain found in Christ Jesus. When Satan turned from Christ, he also turned from his own identity as a Son of God. In order to be a Son, we must behold the Son, for by beholding we are changed. Satan rejected his sonship to God and began to erase from his mind the seal of the Father, replacing it with a mystery that allowed him to worship himself. To dispute the supremacy of the Son of God, thus impeaching the wisdom and love of the Creator, had become the purpose of this prince of angels. To this object he was about to bend the energies of that master mind, which, next to Christ's, was first among the hosts of God. But he who would have the will of all his creatures free left none unguarded to the bewildering sophistry by which rebellion would seek to justify itself. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 36. 
If Lucifer had remained in submission to the Son of God, he might have continued to drink the delights of the Father through Christ. He might have remained a son through the Spirit of the Son. Sadly, he rejected this, and in stepping out from his position, he fell into the darkness of worthlessness. Satan stood in amazement at his new condition. His happiness was gone. He looked upon the angels who, with him, were once so happy, but who had been expelled from heaven with him. Before their fall, not a shade of discontent had marred their perfect bliss. Now all seemed changed. Countenances which had reflected the image of their maker were gloomy and despairing. Strife, discord, and bitter recrimination were among them. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 28. The wretchedness he realized in losing the sweet light of heaven and the sense of guilt which forced itself upon him and the disappointment he experienced himself in not finding his expectations realized were the cause of this grief. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 30. Satan's gloom and despair were inherited by Adam and Eve when they ate of the fruit from which they were commanded not to eat. This gloom and worthlessness came directly from their loss of identity. It was lost because of turning away from the Father's delight resting in his Son. It was the sorrow of a self-imposed orphan. This same loss and sorrow exist today. 1 John 2.23 reads, Whoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. It is not hard to understand when a person feels of little or no value, it will manifest in self-destructive worthlessness. Sin is the manifestation of the belief that the one who gave us life does not value us. The serpent insinuated this in the garden. Genesis 3 verse 5 reads, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Satan suggested that God was hiding something from Adam and Eve that would prove a blessing to them. Such a belief led to the thought that God did not truly love them. The thought that God does not truly love us leads us to sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. James 1.15 The remedy for sin, therefore, is the revelation of the love of God for us as our delighted Father. The place where this love is fully manifested is in the delight that God expressed for his son on the first Sabbath in Eden. The Sabbath is therefore the agency through which the delighting spirit of the Father restores to our minds his truly loving care for us. It is upon this day that we are breathed upon through Christ and our minds are sanctified into an understanding of the love of the Father. We can only receive this complete blessing of the Father through Christ. As Christ's Lordship is found in the Sabbath, we therefore can only receive the complete blessing of the Father through the Sabbath. This is why the Sabbath is the sanctifying sign or miracle of our God. Ezekiel chapter 20 verse 12 reads, Moreover also I gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign or miracle in Strong's between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord that sanctify them. The issue of our sonship and daughtership to God is the key to the war between Christ and Satan. Satan revealed this when he said to Christ, Matthew 4 verse 3, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Satan questioned Christ concerning his sonship and how it was defined. The Father had told Christ 40 days earlier that he was his son. Would Christ believe the Father's word or try to prove it by his power? Christ rested in the word of his Father and trusted that God truly was his Father by faith. To seek to prove he was a son would have meant that he did not accept it by faith in the word of God. As the Son of God received the seal of his Father's blessing on the first Sabbath of creation, so also we are completely restored and sealed in our sonship to God through the Sabbath. This is why the Sabbath will be the great test in the final crisis. Chapter 3. No Sabbath Without Sacrifice 
Would it not have been a simple thing for Adam and his children to come to the Sabbath each week to receive the Father's blessing and start the restoration process of the Father's delight in his children? This was not possible, for when Satan turned from his sonship to God, he rejected the spirit of sonship found in Christ. In fact, Satan had wanted to kill the Son of God from the very beginning. John 8 verse 44 reads, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. When Adam submitted himself to Satan, he was overtaken by an orphan spirit that hated Christ and wanted to be acknowledged as an equal, rather than being a son. As Satan said in the beginning, Isaiah 14, verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. It is impossible to receive the Father's delight if we refuse to accept that our hearts are naturally at war with the Son of God. God does love us, but we can't receive His love unless we return to sonship. So, in order to come into Sabbath rest, we must acknowledge that by nature we are responsible for the death of the Son of God. Every desire to be first, every effort to prove oneself better than another, every effort to display personal power as a reason why we should be valued, is always moving towards an attempt to destroy the Son of God. Jeremiah 9 verses 23-24 read, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. To glory in our own wisdom, might, or wealth, is to not glory in knowing the Father. It is not acknowledging that all things come from Him. The Son of God is constantly in a place of acknowledging that all He has comes from His Father. John 5 verse 19 reads, Then answered Jesus and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of Himself, but what He seeth the Father do, for what things soever He doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. John 3, verses 34-35 through 35 reads, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. It is therefore impossible to receive the delight of the Father in us when we do not come to him in the Spirit of his Son. The only way to do this is to acknowledge that by nature we have warred against the Son of God, and our attitudes and behavior have been such that given the chance, we would kill the Son. The means by which we make this acknowledgement is to confess the death of Christ for us. When we accept that he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, then the door is opened into the sanctuary of our Father for us, to receive his blessing. Every selfish desire wounds and tortures the Son of God. We dare not simply accept that Jesus suffered for us 2,000 years ago, but today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Today he is wounded. Today he suffers from our selfishness. Today he is despised and rejected of men. When our eyes are opened, when our eyes are opened to this reality, then and only then can we come into the truth Sabbath experience. The point here is that it is impossible to come into the Sabbath rest when we do not accept the sacrifice of Christ for our soul. No one can have rest in Christ while he is at the same time crucifying him and putting him to an open shame. Hebrews 6.6 6. Therefore, we cannot appear before the Lord empty. Exodus 23, verse 15. Exodus 23, 15. We must come with a sacrifice. Our sacrifice is a contrite heart and a broken spirit. 
Psalms 51, 17. In acknowledging our natural selfishness, and therefore our hatred towards Christ, sacrifice and Sabbath are always connected. The one provides entrance into the other. We hold these truths to be self-evident in the light of the war for our identity as sons and daughters of God. Until we accept that in our sinful state we are trampling the Son of God underfoot, we can never enter into true sonship to God. Until we acknowledge the sufferings of the Son on our account, we cannot become sons, but rather we remain worthless bastards who cannot cease from sin, for sin is the evidence of lost sonship or daughtership. It is evidence that we have not found rest in the true love of the Father. With these thoughts in mind, we see that the Sabbath becomes a beacon of hope as a remedy for sin. When we see the broken Savior upon the cross, we see what our wicked desires have done to him, and then we turn to God in repentance and receive the blessing of Christ and taste of the sweet delight that God has for his Son. We become accepted in the Beloved, and all the spiritual blessings that Christ possessed become ours by faith. In this sonship to God, we cease to sin because we cease to doubt his love, and we rest in perfect joy, knowing the Father will always love and cherish us, and only do what is best for us. What a precious thought! What sublime consolation we have in Christ and his Sabbath! So we see on the Sabbath how the Spirit of Christ pours forth from the throne of God, carrying the delight of the Father and seeking entrance into all hearts open to acknowledge Him. Those who accept Christ's sacrifice and then embrace His commandments, connects them to the Sabbath and then, by faith, enter into all the fullness of sonship or daughtership to God. Every Sabbath day connects us to the Father's delight in His Son. The arm placed around Him is inherited by us. The joy and delight of the Son is experienced by us every Sabbath. We find that the cross at the heart of the gospel and the Sabbath at the heart of the law kiss each other and release to us the Father's delight that we might exclaim, as it says in 1 John 3, 1 through 2, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And Romans 8.16 The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The gospel is a revelation of how and when the Father comes to us and tells us how precious we are to him and how much he loves us. Chapter 4. The Gospel in the Law From the beginning, the Lord revealed to the patriarchs the seasons of refreshing from the Lord when the Father's delight would be revealed in Christ. When the patriarchs would offer a lamb by faith at the time appointed, they would then connect to the Spirit of Christ, which possessed the delight of the Father, and, being led by the Spirit, would be affirmed in their sonship to God. Romans 8.14 reads, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And John 1 verse 12 reads, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Satan quickly moved to pervert the times and sacrifices which God had appointed to come to bless his children. After Israel came out of Egypt, Christ restored to Moses a complete explanation of the gospel through the commandments, statutes, and judgments of the Lord that had been lost in Egypt. The scripture says of Abraham, Genesis chapter 26 verse 5, Because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. While Moses was in the mount, God presented to him not only the tables of the law, but also the plan of salvation. He saw that the sacrifice of Christ was prefigured by all the types and symbols of the Jewish age, and it was the heavenly light streaming from Calvary, no less than the glory of the law of God, that shed such a radiance upon the face of Moses. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 330. 
the light that shone on Moses' face was not a symbolic light. It was real light that caused the children of Israel to request Moses to cover his face. The light had come from his beholding Calvary by faith and from seeing how the Father connects his children to himself through the Sabbath and the cross. Moses was given the specific times when a sacrifice was to be offered for the nation. The sacrifices and their timing were significant. The time at which the sacrifice was offered provided a channel for the blessing of the Father to be poured out as he poured out his blessing on his son on the first Sabbath. Let us examine when the sacrifices were to be offered according to the law. First Chronicles chapter 23, verses 30-31 through 31 reads, And to stand every morning to thank and praise the Lord, and likewise at even, and to offer all burnt sacrifices unto the Lord in the Sabbaths, in the new moons, and on the set feasts by number according to the order commanded unto them continually before the Lord. And Second Chronicles chapter 8, verses 12-13 through 13 reads, Then Solomon offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the altar of the Lord, which he had built before the porch even after a certain rate every day, offering according to the commandment of Moses on the Sabbaths and on the new moons and on the solemn feasts three times in the year, even in the Feast of Unleavened Bread and in the Feast of Weeks and in the Feast of Tabernacles. The law reveals that sacrifices were offered, number one, at morning, number two, at evening, number three, on the Sabbath number four, in the new moon, number five, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, number six, the Feast of Weeks, and number seven, on the Feast of Tabernacles. We find a beautiful connection between the sacrifices and the Sabbath in the use of the number seven. In the table below, we will add to the end of the annual cycle some extra sevens mentioned in the law. The times for these sacrifices are not random events, but are carefully connected to the number seven in order to reveal the Sabbath seven principle connected to all the major divisions of time. It is found in each day, week, month, and year. The seventh day is the day upon which the Father blessed his Son when the six days of work were completed. When the work is completed through the period of six units, the seventh unit provides a time for reflection and to taste of the delight of the Father and to renew our sense of identity as children of God. On account of the special honors God conferred upon the seventh day, he required his people to number by sevens, lest they should forget their Creator who made the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 53, paragraph 1. We will now go through the graph in this order. Number one, time frame. Number two, event. Number three, sixes, sevens, and rest. And number four, the references. On the seventh hour was the daily sacrifice. Six hours between morning and evening sacrifice, and six hours that Christ labored on the cross, then rested. Mark chapter 15, verse 25, chapter 15, verse 34, Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Psalms chapter 141, verse 2, and Numbers chapter 28, verse 8. On the seventh day was the Sabbath, six days of work, then rest. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 10. For seven days was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, seven days of unleavening. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 6. Seven weeks plus one constituted Pentecost. Count seven weeks to Pentecost, then rest. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15. Seventh month, count seven moons. Trumpets, atonements, tabernacles, seven plus one days. Count six months, then three feasts in the seventh month. Leviticus chapter 21, verses 24 through 39. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 23. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 23. Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 1. On the seventh year was the land's Sabbath. Count six years, then seventh was a year of rest. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 3. And seven times seven years plus one was the Jubilee. Count seven times seven years to Jubilee, then rest. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 8 through 10. And finally, the seventh 
times 1,000 years, or the millennium. Count six times 1,000 years, then rest. Revelation chapter 20, verse 6. Notice how inspiration does not simply tell us to remember every seventh day, but rather to number by sevens. Is it possible that our Father wants to write into every division of time his great love for his Son and for us through him? Chapter 5, Like a Fountain Flowing There is a beautiful illustration in the book of Exodus that gives us a deeper appreciation of what happens at the time of sacrifice. Exodus chapter 17, verses 3 through 6 reads, And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses, and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt, to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And take with thee the elders of Israel, and thy rod wherewith thou smotest the river, take in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. The rock that Moses struck was a symbol of Christ slain for us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 4 reads, And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Matthew 24 verse 31 reads, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. Through the symbolism of the smitten rock, we see the life-giving stream that flows forth at the moment it is struck. We also have another symbol of this in the very death of Christ on the cross. John chapter 19 verse 34 reads, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. The smitten rock was a figure of Christ, and through this symbol the most precious spiritual truths are taught. As the life-giving waters flowed from the smitten rock, so from Christ, smitten of God, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, Isaiah 53 verses 4 and 5, the stream of salvation flows for a lost race. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 411. When the symbolism of the slain lamb is combined with the smitten rock, we find that the life-giving streams of redemption flow out during all these sevens. If we acknowledge the sacrifice of Christ in the morning when we rise, the living stream opens for us, and we are breathed upon with the Father's delight through Christ. After a period of six hours, the evening sacrifice is remembered. For those who acknowledge the sacrifice of Christ and pause to remember, Once again, the fountain opens for us, and we can swim in the current of the Father's love toward us. This continues into each Sabbath, each new moon, and then in each of the appointed feasts when the Lamb was to be slain. In each and every one of these appointments, the Father sends out to us His delight through His Son. When we acknowledge the Son, the streams enter into our hearts, and we are sanctified in the process. In our restful sonship, we cease to sin and no longer express our former self-imposed, orphaned worthlessness. If the sacrificial system was designed to point to one event in 6,000 years, would not this be reflected in the sacrifice of one lamb a year or one lamb in seven years? Does not the sacrifice every day, week, month, and year suggest the flowing forth of the streams of love at the times that these sacrifices were offered? If there were no life-giving streams coming at these times, then the slaughter of thousands of animals served no meaningful benefit to those offering the sacrifices. They only served to keep alive the teaching of the future Messiah. It would be impossible for Moses to have the light streaming from Calvary shining on his face if he was not living in the precious current of the Father's delight through the sacrifice of the Son of God, 
slain from the foundation of the world. Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. When we see the Sabbath as the time when the Father expresses his delight in his Son in a complete manner, then is it really that hard to see the Father as desiring to send this message into every aspect of time? Each day, every week, every month, every year, every seven years, every seven times seven years plus one, the Father is calling out to his children. The living stream of the Father's love pours upon us in greater measure at the times appointed. What a precious thought. It makes the Sabbath so sweet and creates a sense of anticipation. Just think about it. When you wake up in the morning and come to morning worship, can you now open your heart to your Father in greater realization of the fact that at that time His Spirit is truly being poured out upon you and telling you, You are my beloved child in whom I delight? The same occurs each evening and then each Sabbath, and on and on it continues. Is this something you desire? Take up your bed and walk in these statutes of love. There are many who would say, I don't need to wait for any special time to know that I am a child of God through Christ Jesus. I know this every second of the day. Would you say something similar to your wife or children? We don't need any special times to remember the specialness of our family. We know we love each other and we can tell each other anytime. There is no need for anniversaries or special events in our lives. Does a wife say to her husband, You know that I love you and therefore we don't need any special times of intimacy to celebrate our relationship. It is a self-evident truth that we have seasons for all things of life. We eat at set times rather than eating all day. We have set times for work play and sleep. We also have dedicated times for worship, in which case we cease from other activity to focus on what we are doing. This is a biblical principle clearly revealed. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 1 reads, To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. The Bible tells us that when we listen to God's commandments, then our righteousness from him is like the waves of the sea. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 18 reads, Oh, that thou hast hearkened to my commandments, then had thy peace been as a river, and thy righteousness as the waves of the sea. The waves come in sets that ebb and flow. This is how the appointments of our Father come to us through the statutes. Each wave moves up the beach and then recedes into the ocean. At a broader level, the tide moves up the beach and then recedes down the beach. Then, at new moon and full moon, they move very high up the beach. All these natural wonders teach us how the righteousness of our God comes to us. Notice what the scriptures tell us about when the refreshing occurs. Acts chapter 3 verse 19 reads, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. This verse shows us that there are times of refreshing. The word in Greek is plural and tells us that there is more than one time of refreshing. The blotting out of sin is speaking about the sealing and the sealing is connected to the Sabbath. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty for it is the point of truth especially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men, then the line of distinction will be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve him not. While the observance of the false Sabbath, in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be avowed of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. While one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, receive the mark of the beast, the other, choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority, receive the seal of God. Great Controversy, page 605, paragraph 2. Jesus is in his holy temple and will now accept our sacrifices, our prayers, and our confessions of faults and sins, and will pardon all the transgressions of Israel, that they may be blotted out before he leaves the sanctuary. When Jesus leaves the sanctuary, then they who are holy and righteous will be holy and righteous still, for all their sins will then be blotted out, and they will be sealed with the seal of the living God. 
Early Writings, page 48. How is it possible for the Sabbath to be the seal of God unless we believe that it is a miracle of God between us and Him? What is that miracle? It is the melted heart of the child of God when he accepts the words of the Father. You are my beloved Son, in whom I delight. He accepts this truth in the face of all his wickedness against God. He believes he is forgiven and rests in the Father's arms in Christ. Chapter 7. Magnification of the Blessing The things of nature speak to us of the love of God in many ways. The tides of the ocean are affected by the sun and of the moon. At the time of the new moon and full moon, the tides upon the earth are much higher. The scriptures tell us that the sun and moon were also created for seasons. Genesis 1, 14 reads, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. The word season in the Hebrew is moed, Strong's H4150 from H3259. Properly, an appointment, that is, a fixed time or season, specifically a festival. So the sun and the moon are to be used to determine appointments and especially festivals or feasts. What is most interesting is the description of the woman in Revelation 12. Revelation 12.1 reads, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. The church of God is clothed in the timing of her God. The sun, moon, and stars are provided for determining the seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Paul partly speaks to this when he said to the Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians 5.1, but of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. The word for seasons used here is exactly the same word used in the Greek Old Testament for seasons in Genesis 1.14. This word is moed in the Hebrew. So the church of God, as revealed in Revelation 12, is clothed in the light of God's love. This love is revealed in seasons of refreshing connected to the numbering of sevens in accordance with the Sabbath seven principle. The Sabbath is the time in which the Father manifested his supreme delight in his Son. We see the Apostle John wearing this garment when he states, 1 John 3.1 Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. This is the garment Christ wore when confronting Satan in the wilderness. He clung to this assurance at his baptism. Matthew 3.17 reads, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I delight. Tyndale Version The church of God overcomes by the blood of the Lamb, or sacrifice, and the word of their testimony. And their testimony is that they are indeed children of God, loved of the Father. This testimony comes to them especially in the Sabbath 7 principle. So if we come back to the sun and moon in relation to the tides, we notice that the weekly Sabbath is observed by counting the seventh rotation of the sun in relation to the earth. The annual festivals all occur in the first seven months of the year and require a counting of seven cycles of the moon in the relation to the earth. If the sun and moon have an effect on the tides of the ocean, could it also be that when the Sabbath of the week falls within an annual Sabbath like Passover and Tabernacles, there could be a high tide of spiritual blessing? Notice in John 19.31, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, and that they might be taken away. Christ was crucified on the Friday, which was the Passover. The following day was the seventh day Sabbath, and also the first day of unleavened bread. John called this a high Sabbath. This was a weekly Sabbath aligned or joined with an 
annual Sabbath. The word in the Greek can also be translated great, large, or loud. Is it possible that when the two Sabbaths align, the voice of our Father to his children speaks louder to us and reaches more deeply into our hearts when we respond to his call? Like the higher tide of the ocean, is it possible that there is a higher tide of the Spirit speaking into our souls at these times? The woman stands on the moon in Revelation 12, and the book of Psalms tells us, Psalm 104, verse 19, He appointed the moon four seasons. The sun knoweth his going down. The Lord has appointed the moon for seasons, or moed. When we listen for our Father's voice according to his appointments, then his voice is perceived more loudly to us and says, You are my beloved Son, in whom I delight. This is in complete harmony with the Father and Son relationship. As the Son of God is the brightness of the Father's glory, so also the annual appointments make brighter the Father's love for us, through Christ his Son, in the weekly appointment. For more on this principle, see the book Divine Pattern of Life. If the Apostle John called the combination of the first day of unleavened bread and the weekly Sabbath a high day, then what can be high about it except for that which the Sabbath was originally intended? A blessing from our Father in greater measure. Taste for yourself and see. One of the disciples, John, gives us a picture of what the Apostle John believed. John believed that the observance of Passover was part of the gospel. Polycrates states, Therefore we keep the day undeviatingly, neither adding nor taking away. For in Asia minor, great luminaries sleep, and they will rise in the day of the coming of the Lord, when he shall come with the glory from heaven and seek out all the saints. Such were Philip and two of his daughters. There is also John who lay on the Lord's breast, and there is also Polycarp at Smyrna, both bishop and martyr, and Thracius, both bishop and martyr, from Euania, also Sigaris, Papirius, and Melito. All of these kept the 14th day of the Passover according to the gospel, never swerving, but following according to the rule of faith. And I also, Polycrates, the least of you all, live according to the tradition of my kinsmen, and some of them have I followed. For seven of my family were bishops, and I am the eighth. And my kinsmen ever kept the day when the people put away the leaven. Therefore, brethren, I who have lived sixty-five years in the Lord, and conversed with brethren from every country, and have studied all holy scripture, and am not afraid of threats, for they have said who were greater than I, it is better to obey God rather than men. SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 9, page 362. When you accept that the delight of the Father is given to his children through Christ in the Sabbath 7 principle, it is a simple thing to see all the appointments of the Lord as part of the gospel. There are many who believe that the feasts of the Lord were not actually spiritual feasts for those living before the cross. They believe that the feasts were only symbolic of Christ's work hundreds of years after their day. Such a belief denies the work of Christ in the gospel before the cross and that the light of Calvary shone from the face of Moses. There is only one way you can obtain rest, and that is through the Spirit of Christ. All of the following texts speak of rest, the resting and the Father's delight in Christ. Exodus 16 verse 23 reads, And he said unto them, This is that which the Lord hath said. Tomorrow is the rest, or Shabbaton, of the Holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Exodus 31.15 reads, Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest, or Shabbaton again, holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 16 verse 30-31 
For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you, to cleanse you, that ye may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. And it shall be a Sabbath of rest, Shabbaton, unto you, and ye shall afflict your souls by a statute forever. Leviticus 23 verse 24 reads, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, Shabbaton, a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. And Leviticus 23 verse 39. Also in the fourteenth day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, Shabbaton, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath, Shabbaton. Notice that for each of the above times the word Shabbaton is used. The word rest here is the very rest found in Christ. It is impossible to rest, or Shabbat, outside of Christ. Matthew 11, verse 28 reads, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word rest used by Christ is the Greek equivalent of Shabbaton. So, the fourth commandment can only be kept within the gospel, a gospel that brings us to the Father's delight by the Spirit of Christ. Chapter 8, The Sabbath More Fully I have been a Sabbath keeper all my life. I have attended church services throughout all of this time. The Sabbath had been explained to me as a special time to fellowship with the Lord. It is His special day. Not once in all that time was it explained to me that the Sabbath is, in fact, a special gift of the Holy Spirit. When I studied the writings of A.T. Jones in relation to the Sabbath, I came across the following statement, in one of his sermons. What was it that made the day holy? Congregation, the presence of God. The presence of God makes things holy. It makes a place holy. It makes a man holy. The presence of God made the day holy. Then the holiness of God is attached to the day. The presence of God, the holy presence of God, is attached to the seventh or Sabbath day. Well then, the man comes to that day as only man can come to it, spiritually minded, with the mind of the Spirit of God, and receives the spiritual rest, the spiritual refreshing that is in it, the spiritual blessing that is in it. Does he not also receive that presence, become a partaker of that presence, in which is the holiness of God to transform him? He does indeed, and that is Sabbath keeping. Well, then he sanctified the day. But I need not rehearse those texts either. What is it that sanctifies? Congregation replies, the presence of God. Then the presence of God, his sanctifying power, is in the seventh day. Is that so? Congregation replies, yes. Then the man who comes to the Sabbath of the Lord, according to the Lord's idea of the Sabbath of the Lord and his intent, obtains spiritual rest. He finds that there. He finds spiritual refreshing, delight. He finds spiritual blessing. He finds the presence of God and the holiness which that presence brings to transform him. And he finds that sanctifying power in that presence which sanctified the day to sanctifying him. For what purpose was all this done? Why was the Sabbath made? Congregation. For man. It was made for man. Well then, God rested and put his spiritual rest upon the day for man, did he? Congregation says, yes. God's refreshing, his rejoicing in that day was for man. The blessing with which he blessed it was for man. The holiness which his presence brought to it and which his presence gave to it was for man. His presence sanctifying it was for man. Well, then, was it not that man through the Sabbath might be a partaker of his presence and be made acquainted by living experience with the spiritual rest of God, the spiritual blessing, the holiness, the presence of God to make holy, the presence of God to sanctify him? Is not that what God intended the Sabbath to bring to man? The man who gets all that in the Sabbath 
is the man who is a Sabbath keeper. And he knows it too. He knows it and he is delighted to know it. Now another thing, who was the real present agent in creating? Congregation, Christ. Who was it that rested? Congregation, Christ. Who was refreshed? Congregation, Christ. Who blessed? Congregation, Christ. Whose presence made it holy? Congregation, Christ. Whose presence is in the day? Congregation replies, Christ. Then the man whom the presence of Jesus Christ does not sanctify and does not make holy and does not bless and to whom it does not bring rest, why? He can't keep the Sabbath. Don't you see? It is only with Christ in the man that the Sabbath can be kept because the Sabbath brings and has in it the presence of Christ. A.T. Jones, GCB Sermon 20, 1893. A.T. Jones clearly reveals the blessing in the Sabbath is the presence of God and the presence of Christ. It had never been explained to me quite this way before. Why is it not trumpeted to the nations that the fullest measure of the gift of the Holy Spirit is found in the Sabbath? This is the only possible way that the Sabbath can be the seal of God, for we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 verse 30 reads, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. And Ephesians 1.13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit of promise comes to us at the seasons of refreshing. The Holy Spirit is promised to us at the times appointed. To illustrate this point, Consider the timing of the promised gift of the Holy Spirit after the resurrection of Christ. Acts 2.15 reads, For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. The Holy Spirit was poured out with great power after counting seven weeks plus one day after the Feast of Firstfruits. It came during the third hour, which is the time of the morning sacrifice. We recall that there is a gift of the Spirit every day according to the morning and evening sacrifice. The morning sacrifice was at the third hour, and the evening sacrifice came after an interval of six hours. So the gift of the Spirit came on the appointment of the day of Pentecost at the time of the morning sacrifice. This is not a random event, but exactly according to the timing of our Father. The woman who stands on the moon and is clothed in the sun, knew to gather during this appointed time in order to receive a blessing of our Father through the Lord Jesus. So indeed, there is a special blessing that comes each day. It comes with the morning and the evening sacrifice. For us today, this means a gathering for morning and evening worship in order to receive the gift of our Father through recognition of the sacrifice of our Savior. In every family, there should be a fixed time for morning and evening worship. How appropriate is it for parents to gather their children about them before the fast is broken, to thank the Heavenly Father for his protection during the night, and to ask him for his help and guidance and watch care during the day. How fitting also when evening comes for parents and children to gather once more before him and thank him for the blessings of the day that is past. Child Guidance, page 520, paragraph 1. In arousing and strengthening a love for Bible study, much depends on the use of the hour of worship. The hours of morning and evening worship should be the sweetest and most helpful of the day. Let it be understood that into these hours no troubled, unkind thoughts are to intrude that parents and children assemble to meet with Jesus and to invite into the home the presence of holy angels. Let the services be brief and full of light, adapted to the occasion, and varied from time to time. Let all join in the Bible reading and learn and often repeat God's law. Child Guidance, page 522. For years I found morning and evening worship very difficult to maintain. Now that I know these are spiritual appointments from our Father to receive a daily gift of His Spirit, it has become a delight. It is not a work that is done in order to merit salvation, but rather 
It is receiving the righteousness of Christ by faith and coming when he calls. Do you wish to receive the gift of the Spirit that comes morning and evening? Do you need such a gift? If our Father is offering it to you, then I suggest that we do need it. A true Sabbath keeper is one who believes that our Father sends his Spirit to us at appointed times. Just as we eat at set times and are carried on the strength of that meal for five or six hours, so also we receive gifts of the Spirit at set times and walk in the strength of those appointed times. This is the Sabbath more fully, and this truth will enrage the churches and the nominal Adventists. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the churches and nominal Adventists, as they could not refute the Sabbath truth. Early Writings, page 33. Why did the righteous proclaim the Sabbath more fully? It is because through the Sabbath day they are receiving special gifts of the Holy Spirit. Does Satan want people to receive these things? Certainly not. This is the reason why he worked through the little horn power to change the sacred festivals and the law. Daniel 7.25 reads, He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws and they will be placed under his control for a time, times, and a half a time. New Living Translation It is obvious why Satan wants to change the sacred festivals when you know that through these appointments, the children of God are renewed in their sense of sonship and daughtership to God. They enter into the delight of the Father for his Son that he expressed on that first Sabbath day. In Christ, we receive this spiritual blessing in its fullness. Chapter 9 The Midnight Cry The parable of the ten virgins in Matthew 25 plays a key role in the experience of God's people just before the close of probation. Matthew 25 verses 1-6 through six read, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The difference between the wise and the foolish virgins is that the wise virgins had extra oil in their vessels with their lamps. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. The wise virgins have received more of the Holy Spirit than the foolish. How do they receive it? The wise virgins stand on the moon clothed in the sun. They respond to the call of Christ in Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The wise come when he calls them. Here is an example of Jesus calling. John seven thirty seven. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Jesus called them during the time of the feast, for this was an appointed season of the Father to give a higher tide of the Spirit. We make the point that we can come to Christ at any time, day or night, and yet the promptings of the Spirit will call us especially during these times. Number one, in the morning. Number two, in the evening. Number three, on the Sabbath. Number four, during the new moons. Number five, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Number six, the Feast of Weeks. And number seven, the Feast of Tabernacles. These are the seasons of refreshing that operate on the Sabbath seven principle. The Lord laid a foundation for the people of God in 1844 when the midnight cry was given. The Lord led a man by the name of Samuel Snow 
to accurately determine the biblical calendar for determining the Day of Atonement. When he announced the date of August of 1844, the Spirit was poured out with greater power. Near the close of the second angel's message, I saw a great light from heaven shining upon the people of God. The rays of this light seemed bright as the sun. And I heard the voices of angels crying, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This was the midnight cry, which was to give power to the second angel's message. Angels were sent from heaven to arouse the discouraged saints and prepare them for the great work before them. The most talented men were not the first to receive the message. Angels were sent to the humble, devoted ones and constrained them to raise the cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Those entrusted with the cry made haste, and in the power of the Holy Spirit sounded the message, and aroused their discouraged brethren. This work did not stand in the wisdom and learning of men, but in the power of God, and his saints who heard the cry could not resist it. The most spiritual received the message first, and those who had formerly led in the work were the last to receive and help swell the cry. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Early Writings, page 238, paragraph 2. It was the circulation of the calendar that gave the midnight cry its power. This light was to light the path all the way to the city. I turned to look for the Advent people in the world, but could not find them, when a voice said to me, Look again, and a little higher. At this I raised my eyes and saw a straight and narrow path, cast up high above the world. On this path the Advent people were traveling to the city, which was at the farther end of the path. They had a bright light set up behind them at the beginning of the path, which an angel told me was the midnight cry. This light shone all along the path and gave light for their feet so that they might not stumble. Early Writings, page 14. The midnight cry included all the prophetic teachings of the Millerites to obtain the year 1844, but it was the calendar message from Samuel Snow that brought the movement to a head. This light would light the path all the way to the city of God. This means the calendar discovered by Samuel Snow has relevance for us today. In knowing this calendar, God's people can know the times and the seasons and become part of the woman standing on the moon, clothed in the sun. We can receive the power of the Spirit more fully through the seasons of refreshing appointed by our Father. Since 1844, the Sabbath has been a testing truth in order to receive the Spirit needed for sealing of the soul in these last days. It is the extra virgin oil of the wise. Be not faithless, but believing. The Father delights in us and will give us the kingdom as we respond to his appointed calls. When we allow Christ to sit on the mount of the Moedim, Isaiah 14, 13, rather than Satan, then we will come unto him when he calls us and receive his sealing spirit rest. Chapter 10, Called Out of Darkness. This booklet has laid out several biblical proofs for how the Sabbath more fully culminates in the Father's seal upon our foreheads through the Spirit of His Son. I would now like to share with you some of my personal testimony as a second witness, for it is written, Revelation 12, verse 11, And they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Just under three weeks after the New York Twin Towers came down on September 11, 2001, I was presenting some meetings just north of Sydney in Australia. The presentations contrasted two kingdoms. The kingdom of God provides us value by our relationship to our Heavenly Father through Christ. The kingdom of Satan creates value by personal power, position, and performance. The fall of Satan was presented as the fall from his sonship to God into a cycle of of worthless emptiness. The human race inherited this worthlessness when it fell into sin. The key to overcoming this kingdom was to enter into the sonship of Jesus by faith.
The Father revealed our true sonship in Christ at his baptism and also in the conflict with Satan in the wilderness. We are accepted in the Beloved, Ephesians 1.6. The words of the Father to his Son at the baptism are ours by faith. What event sparked all these thoughts for me? In the first half of 2001, I was taking a walk on Sabbath morning. Due to illness, I had not been able to attend church for a number of weeks. I remembered the joy I felt when my wife handed him to me. As I looked into his eyes, I stood transfixed by this bundle of joy in my arms. I prayed at that moment, Dear Lord, don't let anything come between me and my son, and I just want him to know me for who I am. As I recalled that thought prayer, I heard a voice in my head at that moment, Adrian, that is how I feel about you. It took me completely by surprise. Deep within me, there came this spirit of resistance. But Lord, how could you love a sinner like me? The thought alarmed me because I believed in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and yet, at a deeper level, this doubt surfaced that I never knew was there. When my Heavenly Father found a way through my Son to tell me how precious I was to Him, it brought my worthlessness to the surface, and I found myself fighting against Him even when I didn't want to. The words of my Father were like a fire in the midst of my soul. These words confronted my worthlessness and were eager to devour it. This wrestle went on for several minutes until finally I heard a voice in my mind. Are you going to reject my love for you? I was taken aback again, and I immediately confessed my sin and said in my heart, Lord, I accept your grace through Christ's sacrifice. It is simply too wonderful to grasp, but I accept it. Through my Son, my Heavenly Father reached to the core of my being to reveal His love for me through His Son. He unearthed my feelings of worthlessness and won my heart. It is very interesting that it was on the Sabbath that he expressed his delight in me through his Son. Yet even though I tasted this freedom, the enemy would not give up without a fight. The flames of love would need some time to consume my worthlessness. These new thoughts completely transformed my way of thinking and set me on a path I could never imagine. Preaching the freedom of our sonship in Christ is one thing, but realizing how much the other kingdom has a hold on your heart is another. And so I discovered personally, for myself, the great controversy in the form of an identity war. I found myself shifting back and forth between kingdoms, but my awareness of my worthless, performance-based thinking became clearer and clearer. Each time I fell into the wrong kingdom, I could come to the banks of the river and once again hear the voice, You are my beloved son, through Christ Jesus. I had found the key to the kingdom. I inherited my sonship through Christ's sonship. Chapter 11, Identity Wars. With this key in my mind, I was filled with a deep sense of blessing. The blessing that rests upon the Son of God came to me in many areas of my life. Three years later, I began to share some of these concepts in a youth Bible group, and this is where I met Craig and Bronwyn Jacobson. Craig immediately connected with the message and joined us in presenting this message. The next year, 2005, I began to write out the key principles given to me in 2001, just after 9-11. It took me nearly 12 months to complete, even though it was only a small book. I faced several obstacles in completing it, most of these were tied to former habits related to entertainment. Whenever I would engage any form of entertainment that was at war with the principles of true sonship, I became completely incapable of writing anything. When I confessed my sin, reclaimed my sonship, the words would flow from my mind into the computer with ease. I was amazed that many of the activities that Christians consider harmless made it impossible for me to write and connect to the spirit of this relational kingdom. I learned fast that if I wanted to remain in this kingdom, all recreation and entertainment that fostered a love of power and performance must be removed from my life. Even though I had been aware of many of these things from reading the spirit of prophecy, 
my ability to overcome them was limited. I found myself regularly slipping back into old habits after periods of cleaning out my room from things that slowly turned my affections from Christ. In my case, it was largely documentary and history films, sports, and some computer games. My new identity as a son of God at first intensified the warfare between the flesh and the spirit. It felt rather strange as I watched other people feel completely relaxed in engaging certain forms of so-called harmless entertainment that made my life hell. Didn't they feel what I felt? Was there no wrestle in them? It took me a few years to really appreciate the new kingdom principles operating in my life and how many layers of the old kingdom were being uprooted and vanquished. Chapter 12. Tell it to the world. Five or six months after finishing the book Identity Wars, I conducted some meetings in Western Sydney under the same title. The meetings were held on April 28th and 29th of 2006. The first two meetings were entitled Identity Lost and Identity Reclaimed. These were essentially the same as the ones I had presented in 2001. Then I introduced the sermon called The Glory of Children. This sermon took the principles of sonship revealed to me through the story of the baptism of Jesus and brought them to the level of the role of a father to his children. This was the key text. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 6 reads, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. This presentation revealed the role of fathers to bless their children as our Heavenly Father blessed Christ at the baptism. It revealed that the blessing of the Father through Christ passes to the earthly father to give to his children. The role of the mother determines how powerful the blessing of the father will be, for the father only has as much authority as his wife will give him. The next two presentations provided a family history comparing the families of Nimrod and Abraham as expressions of the two kingdoms, one a relational blessing kingdom and the other a power and performance-based kingdom. The final presentation showed how these two kingdoms affected the second angel's message and the fall of Babylon. These thoughts were revolutionary to me, but they were all a natural progression from finding our sonship in the sonship of Christ. The atmosphere in the meetings was amazing. Hearts were moved and light began to dawn on many minds. I went to bed wrapped in the arms of the sonship of Jesus and deeply in love with my heavenly father. Early Sunday morning on April 30th at around 5 a.m., I awoke to the sound of singing. The source of this music was a mystery. I heard the Charles Wesley hymn, And Can It Be? My mind was flooded with thoughts of the cost of Calvary and the joy I had in knowing without a doubt that God was my Father through Christ. At that moment, I felt an overwhelming sense of the Father's love. The emotion was so great I thought I would drown. I was so surprised that I actually said to my Savior, I don't know how much more of this I can handle. It was a foolish thing to say, but I felt no condemnation and the intensity eased. Once again, my worthlessness was coming to the fore, but it was much less than back in 2001. I then heard very clearly the command, this message you must take to the world. The message of our sonship reclaimed through the sonship of Christ and the blessing poured out through fathers in the home and elders and pastors in the church. I agreed to do this, not knowing how. I immediately went to my friend, Eddie Perez, who traveled with me and explained to him what had just happened. He agreed to help me in this new enterprise. The deep blessing I had received was a fire in my soul. I began by calling my wife and sons and blessing them during Friday evening worship. This blessing can't be given until you have received it. Without a deep sense of the love of the Father through the Sonship of Christ, we have nothing to give. When we receive it by faith, then we want to share it. It can't be held back. Chapter 13, The Blessing At one of the churches I was pastoring at the time, I invited the children to come to the front, and one by one, I laid hands on them and blessed them. I prayed silently before each prayer, Lord, what do you want me to tell this child? 
when once I understood that the Father poured his blessing through human channels, I saw the vital role I must play in speaking the word of God into the lives of the families in my congregation. My prayer went something like this. Dear Father, thank you for Marianne. She is your precious daughter in whom you delight through Christ our Lord. May she always know that you love her and give her the grace to obey her parents and may she grow to be a woman of God always standing for the right. We thank you in Jesus' name. Father, thank you for Stephen. He is your beloved son in whom you are well pleased through Christ Jesus. May he know we love him as a church family and that he will honor his parents always and grow to be the man of God you have called him to be. I would then add some things that came to mind and close the prayer. The next morning, one of the mothers rang me and said, Do you know what my daughter just said? She said, Mom, I am precious. To which I asked, Why is that, honey? Because the pastor said so, came the reply. Now, I have told my daughter that many times, but she has never been impacted like what happened yesterday. It was a pivotal moment for me. The thought crossed my mind. Now I know what it means to be a pastor. The light began to dawn about the role of fathers, elders, and pastors. James 1 verse 27 reads, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The pure religion of the elders and fathers in the church is to visit the fatherless and the widows and to speak to them the words of the Father. It is their duty to tell them that the Father loves them and that they are precious to him. This is what keeps a person unspotted from the world. It is the principle of the blessing that underlies one of the key qualifications of an elder in the church. 1 Timothy 3 verses 4 through 5 reads, One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? If a man does not know how to bless his wife and children, then how can he bless and care for the church? Being a son of Abraham took on a whole new meaning in the context of blessing. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 through 3 reads, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Shortly after this, we conducted a blessing ceremony where a young person was blessed by the family and the church. It was a deeply spiritual time, and an extended family member of the young person who had no connection to the church indicated that, if this is what your church does, then we want to attend. Shortly after this, I took a history and heritage tour in the United States and visited many places related to the Adventist pioneers. On October 12, 2006, we were visiting William Miller's farm. It was a real honor to visit the home of the man I had read so much about. We had a service in the chapel and then went out into the maple grove to wash one another's feet. I had battled with health issues since 1994, and with the jet lag and amount of travel, I was feeling very tired. I began to think about the command given earlier in the year to take the identity message to the world and I was questioning in my mind if I was feeling so tired all the time. As I sat there in William Miller's Grove, I looked up into the sky, saw two eagles, and immediately this text came to mind. Isaiah 40 verse 31, But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I took hold of the promise and walked out of that grove, trusting that somehow the Lord would do what he had promised. About one month later, I was struck with a thought concerning the blessing of Christ at his baptism. Matthew chapter 3 verse 17 reads, And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This event only had power if this was a real father speaking to a real son. The way my father had reached me was to cause me to look at the love I felt for my son and then compare it with his love for me. 
He then assured me of this love through his words to his son at the baptism. I realized that this could only make sense if Christ was truly begotten of the Father. The thought was impressed upon me. John 5 verse 26 reads, For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Many pieces in the puzzle came together. At the same time, my digestion completely shut down and I could hardly eat. I had to apply for a leave of absence from working as a pastor as I simply could not work. Six weeks later, I attended a church camp with one of the churches I had previously pastored. I was sharing with my friend Ruben Olszewski, one of the church elders, and he picked up on something I mentioned and began probing me on the subject of the Sonship of Christ. We were walking together on Mount Glorious and it was a fitting place for such a discussion. The questions Reuben asked drew out a number of things I was studying, and the answers I gave connected a number of points for him, and he became very excited. His response encouraged me to dig deeper and further, as I had been uncertain what to do with this information. Another close friend had previously shut me down when I broached the subject, so I didn't want to alienate people. Chapter 14 Return of Elijah and Life Matters As I dug more deeply, the conviction continued to grow, as did the certainty that Jesus was the Son of God, and all that he possessed was inherited from his Father. I continued to struggle with my health and had difficulty in eating. At that time, I did a juice fast for about two weeks, and shortly after that, around the middle of July 2007, I awoke in the middle of the night with many thoughts regarding the Son of God and the Adventist doctrinal system. After lying awake for about three hours, I had to get up and write it down. This happened a number of times during the next two weeks in which I completed the first draft of a book. My whole study and experience had been connected to the turning of the hearts of the children to the Father, through fathers, and turning fathers to their children. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. So I called the book, Return of Elijah, because of this message for families. The next few years were filled with an appeal to my church to make room for the begotten son and allow him entrance. This appeal was denied and resulted in the loss of my credentials as a minister. In the latter half of 2008, I felt convicted to write out the relational kingdom principles through all the major doctrines and history of the Bible from what I had learned from writing Identity Wars. This resulted in the book, Life Matters, which was completed towards the end of 2008. In it, I spent quite some time meditating on the posture occupied by husbands and wives that would cause the blessing to flow in greater measure upon their children. I began to see the emergence of the two principles of headship and submission expressed as appreciation and respect, blessing and honor, and generative and nurture characteristics. My previous understanding of male and female equality had essentially merged these positions in my mind. The blessing principle moved me to see a clear distinction between male and female, and this gave me a deeper insight into what it means to be created in the image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 reads, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. I had understood the image mentioned in the above verse as an individual image. Now that the blessing principle was causing a distinction in my mind, I suddenly began to see the image of man and woman as an image of the father and his son, the parallel was clearly revealed in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3 reads, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. The headship of the husband over the wife follows the same principle as the headship of father over son. This means that the blessing that the father gave his son is mirrored in the blessing the husband is to bestow upon his wife. It also reveals that as Eve was taken from Adam, so Christ from the Father. 
Proverbs chapter 8, verse 22 through 25 reads, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting, from the beginning, or ever the earth was. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, was I brought forth. The revelation of the Father blessing his Son at the baptism gave so much more meaning to how husbands are to bless their wives. Yet, in order to give this blessing, the husband himself must be blessed. And this is why Christ is the head of man, in order to bless him. So 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3 gives a cascading blessing of delight from father to son and from son to husband and from husband to wife and of course from husband and wife to children. So when husband and wife worship the true God and his son, they are transformed into the image of blessing and begin to bless. The worship of the true God will automatically bring this blessing when we perceive it. Chapter 15, The Divine Pattern At the beginning of October 2011, all these thoughts about headship and submission, blessing and honor, exploded into print with the book, The Divine Pattern. It was based on the key Adventist pioneer text, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. I wrote nearly every day for two weeks to complete this book. The book had a specific purpose in how a person should deal with headship when it falls into apostasy. The book explained the blessing or cursing that occurs depending on how we move in or out of the appointed channel. Is it right for a wife to challenge her husband publicly with his faults in order to shame him? Will such a posture enhance or diminish his headship and the desire to bless? Should a church member publicly expose the church leaders over him or her? Will it have far deeper ramifications than anticipated? Will it cut off the ability to bless when headship is replaced with a flat level structure of organization? The sorrow I had experienced with my church created an enormous temptation to retaliate and expose the leaders, but I was warned not to touch the Lord's anointed, lest I bring a curse upon myself. One of the things that came to me concerning the divine pattern is that the person in the channel position rests under the headship of the source. As I was writing, it just so happened that this principle was expressed in chapter 7. 7 connects to Sabbath of this book. I like adding extra layers of meaning where I can. In chapter 18 of the book, I wrote these words. This is where the divine pattern becomes important. The principle of the Sabbath is to rest from our labors. Only those who are able to rest in the channel of blessing can't truly rest from their labors. The Divine Pattern, page 122. Without fully realizing it, I began to see that the true Sabbath rest can only be found where Christ is resting in relation to his Father. Christ rests in his full submission and obedience to his Father. This is the only place of rest in the universe, and this is where Christ dwells. If you perceive Christ as a co-equal partner identical to the Father, then there is no place of rest for such a person always stands on their own feet and never leans on anyone else. The divine pattern also laid out how the source and channel principle applies to many relationships. Slowly and surely, I came to see that when God said, let us make man in our image, this meant that all the key things in this life came through the divine pattern of source and channel. The pattern emerged in things such as the following. Source, Old Testament, and channel, New Testament. Source, the most holy place, and channel, the holy place. Source, the Ten Commandments, and channel, the book of the law. Source, the sun, and channel, the moon. Source, the heavenly sanctuary, and channel, the earthly sanctuary. And finally, source, the Bible, and channel, spirit of prophecy. These connections were jumping out all over the place and they connected so many pieces together. It just made so much sense that once you find out who Christ really is, the submissive channel son, then the entire Bible lights up with this image everywhere, 
I then understood the meaning of this passage. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In discovering the mystery of God and Christ, meaning their true relationship, I discovered the hidden treasure of wisdom and knowledge. This discovery just made my mind and heart jump for joy. Such beautiful symmetry written into all creation and at the same time the key to understanding all of scripture. How amazing is God? In conversations with my friends Gary Holquist and Frank Klin, we began to question the implications of the divine pattern on the law and the Sabbath. It came to me that the weekly Sabbath was connected to the sun. We observe seven circuits of the sun around the earth. Psalms 19 verses 4 through 6. The Sabbaths of the year were observed by seven complete cycles of the moon. I wondered to myself, could it be possible that the Sabbath also operates on a divine pattern? One of the key principles of the divine pattern is that of magnification. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 reads, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And 1 Corinthians 11 verse 7 reads, For a man indeed ought not cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. The channel is the glory or brightness of the source. And the thought began to dawn that possibly the annual Sabbaths could bring magnified blessing when aligned with the weekly Sabbath. It must be understood that this only makes sense if you are anchored in the father and son relationship of blessing and rest. This is key. If you are operating on another platform, then none of this makes sense. It all depends on the God you worship and a belief that he desires to bless you. Chapter 16, The Divine Pattern of the Sabbath I studied carefully the subject of the statutes. I asked myself a simple question. What is the relationship of the book of the law to the Ten Commandments? Is it a temporary provision only that leaves the Ten Commandments to stand alone after the cross? Or is it, in fact, a divine pattern? I found the answer in several places, the following being one clear example. The people had shown themselves so easily led astray that he would leave no door of temptation unguarded. Moses was commanded to write, as God should bid him, judgments and laws giving minute instruction as to what was required. These directions relating to the duty of the people to God, to one another, and to the stranger were only the principles of the Ten Commandments amplified and given in a specific manner, that none need err. They were designed to guard the sacredness of the Ten Precepts engraved on the tables of stone. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 364, paragraph 1. Here was the amplification principle. After carefully studying Colossians 2, Acts 15, and Ephesians 2, in the light of the divine pattern, I became satisfied that indeed there was a channel of blessing flowing through the appointments of our Father. I wanted to see for myself if the theory would prove true. In October of 2013, Craig Johnson and I attended the Feast of Tabernacles organized by Gary Holquist in Atlanta, Georgia. I was almost unable to go as I had come down with a fever two weeks before I was to leave. I had only just recovered when I arrived at the meetings. Previously, I could only speak for two or three days, and then I would have to rest. At the feast, I spoke every day for ten days, and was up late every night, and came home stronger than when I went. What we experienced was an outpouring of grace in a magnified way. I confess, I felt nervous at some aspects of this gathering. I was not familiar with some things, and was guarded at times. Yet my thought of the magnified blessing coming with the weekly Sabbath aligned with the annual Sabbath became a reality. 
my brother Igor Vujica, spoke of the safe place of sanctuary where brethren could meet in love, and this took place before our eyes. On the weekly Sabbath of the Feast of Tabernacles, I had planned to invite a few young men to come to the front for a blessing. As I arose and was about to invite them, I was moved to call everyone. Out of the 90 people in the audience, about 80 of them came to the front. It was not sensational emotionalism, but a deep conviction of the love of the Father through Christ his Son. Only those who were there will be able to testify to what happened that day. The love of the Father for his Son from the original Sabbath in Eden was poured out upon us and blessed us. I continued to test this principle of inviting people for a blessing on the Sabbath, and especially on the Sabbath combined with annual feast Sabbaths, every time it was the same. It is not something to be forced upon the people, but the response has always been greater when there is an alignment of the Sabbaths. I have tested this in several countries and across a number of languages through translators. The response has always been the same. So after two years of careful study, prayer, and testing in the face of some really intense opposition, I am completely certain that our Father has given the feasts as a magnification of the weekly Sabbath. He pours out his spirit at these times in accordance with his Sabbath seven principle. All of this connects us to that first Sabbath in Eden when the father said to his son, you are my beloved son. Against such, there can be no law. So at the present time, my journey with the blessing of my father has now completely converged with the blessing in the Sabbath. This is in complete harmony with our pioneers platform to keep all the commandments of God by the faith of Jesus. See the booklet, Stand by the Landmarks, for more on this. There are many that urge that our pioneers never kept the feasts, and therefore we should not keep them either. When you acknowledge that the church rejected the 1888 message, which included the covenants, and walked into darkness, then it is not hard to see why they never came to a place to see the Sabbath more fully. I have prepared a number of booklets addressing this question and they are featured at the end of this booklet. Is it really so hard to see that Satan really does not want people to receive the full blessing of the Heavenly Father through Christ? He will do everything he can to stop this. He has thought to change the sacred festivals and the law. He turned the leaders of the Adventist church against the 1888 message on the covenants back in 1888 and again through the failure of the church to respond to the 1888 study committee, and now the Adventist Godhead movement also has braced itself to resist the light on the same question. Satan does not want you to be blessed, my friend. He does not want you to be touched by the sweet spirit of Jesus that comes in high tide at the times appointed for refreshment. Behold, he stands at the door and knocks for those hungering and thirsting, for righteousness. Chapter 17 Message Founded on Sabbath Appointments As I have gone back and checked the times at which key messages have come to me, there is further evidence of the appointments. Event Conception My personal revelation that my Father in Heaven loves me and wants nothing between me and Him. Time 2001 Seventh Year Sabbath, Leviticus 25, Seventh Day Sabbath. Event, Birth, First Identity Wars Sermons. Time, 2001, September 28th through 30th. Day of Atonement, Seventh Day Sabbath, and Seventh Year Sabbath. Event, Mission, Call to Tell It to the World. Time, 2006, May 1st, New Moon. Event, Resourced. Struggle in Miller's Grove and Promise of Strength. Time, 2006, October 12th, third day of the Feast of Tabernacles, 17th day of the seventh month. Event, Foundation, Life Matters. Time, 2008, seventh year Sabbath. And finally, Event, Key, Divine Pattern. Time, 2011, September 30th through October 14th, period from Feast of Trumpets till... Beginning of Feast of Tabernacles. 
These are not random events. Many of the critical parts of my journey have come during appointed times, and I knew nothing about this until 2015. Before I had even called on him through the statutes, my father has answered and blessed me. Truly, he is gracious and merciful. Back in 2008, when I shared the book, The Return of Elijah, with Craig Jacobson, he and others told me upon finishing it that this was part of the fourth angel's message. Since that time, I have been showing the following statement, which I offer for your consideration. How comes the word that I have declared that New York is to be swept away by a tidal wave? This I have never said. I have said, as I looked at the great buildings going up there, story after story, what terrible scenes will take place when the Lord shall arise to shake terribly the earth. Then the words of Revelation 18, verses 1 through 3, will be fulfilled. The whole of the 18th chapter of Revelation is a warning of what is coming on the earth. But I have no light in particular in regard to what is coming on New York, only that I know that one day the great buildings there will be thrown down by the turning and overturning of God's power. From the light given me, I know that destruction is in the world. One word from the Lord, one touch of his mighty power, and these massive structures will fall. Scenes will take place, the fearfulness of which we cannot imagine. Review and Herald, July 5th, 1906. This statement indicates that the fourth angel's message will begin just after the towers in New York come down. The first Identity Wars message came two and a half weeks after 9-11. I offer these things to you for your consideration. I testify of them and leave it for you to decide if you want the extra virgin olive oil or not. I pray you will come into this precious light and taste the sweet delight of our Father in us. This message was conceived on a Sabbath day during a Sabbath year. It was born on a Sabbath connected to a Day of Atonement within a seventh year. The worldwide scope of the message was given on a new moon and the promise of strength given during the Feast of Tabernacles. The spirit that has led me all this time is the wonderful numberer who keeps his appointments to bless and he will not reverse it. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. This concludes our reading of The Sabbath Fountain, produced by Maranatha Media for fatheroflove.info.